This is an, an age of disruption, of profound revolutionary change. What we're really asking ministers is to empower the ambassadors. The only thing that you really push forth is the truth. You don't see many women represented when it comes to the decisions as to how to handle the pandemic. Hi and welcome. I'm Lauren Cyrillus. I'm cybersecurity editor at Politico Europe, uh, based here in Brussels, uh, where we are coming to you uh, from. We've got a little audience, well, a little, a nice audience um, over here, uh, down at our venue where we're organizing our um, AI and tech summit. Um, and uh, most of them just had lunch, so they seem to be uh, in good spirits. Um, I hope everyone online also had a little lunch and uh, and is also in good spirits. Um, I'm going to moderate a session um, on the Digital Compass, which is uh, the EU's grand plan for uh, the digital sector and digital economy. Um, it is a plan uh, that is as grand um, as uh, its targets by 2030. And the question is, um, how can the European Union um, achieve the targets that it set itself for 2030? Uh, and maybe more specifically, can it achieve the targets it set itself? To talk through that, I'm uh, joined by uh, three uh, panelists online and one here in the room, um, which I'll introduce to you uh, now. Uh, so our first panelist uh, joining us for this discussion is Stefan Schnorr, State Secretary to the Federal Minister for Digital and Transport uh, in Germany. Hi, Stefan. Thank you for joining us. Hello. Se secondly, we've got in the room uh, Josiane Kutayar, who is a uh, Maltese MEP for the Socialists and Democrats here uh, in, at the European Parliament in Brussels. Hi, Josiane. Hi, and uh, best regards to those following us physically and online. <laughs> exactly. And then um, online, we've got uh, Fanny Hidvigi joining us, uh, who is European Policy Manager at Access Now. Hi, Fanny. Thank you for joining. And uh, last but not least, we've got Liz Grennan, uh, who's associate par uh, partner and uh, global co-leader of digital trust at Quantum Black, a company uh, that is part of the McKinsey family. Hi, Liz. Thank you for joining us um, online. Thank you for having me. Before I start the discussion, um, I would like to tell everyone in the room, but also online, uh, that um, this is uh, meant to be a, a fun discussion and an interactive one. So we invite everyone to ask questions. Um, if you can ask questions using the uh, Swap Card app, um, which uh, this event is running on. Um, and so if you go to the session that uh, that we're having right now, you will see um, uh, a space to, to ask your questions. I will get them uh, here in the room and um, I'm happy to throw them at our panelists. Uh, without further ado, so the last point I'll mention is um, uh, this session will uh, last until 2.40, 2.45 roughly, um, which um, is um, uh, just enough time for us to have a vibrant discussion. So we'll get to that now. The discussion uh, that we're having is on the digital decade or digital compass, so the targets that the EU has set itself. Um, and some of those are incredibly, um, incredibly uh, ambitious. Let me just pull out one that I've covered uh, in my reporting a little, uh, which is that the European Union wants to uh, achieve 20% of uh, market value in the chip sector by 2030. It currently has 10. Uh, many of the industry experts I've spoken to about this target say this is a very tough one to make, if not um, nearly impossible. Um, I won't go into all of the targets, but this is just to give you a sense of these are political ambitions and we're now going to drill down a little in, in how realistic they really are and what the Commission's plan uh, is um, or Europe's plan is to get there. Um, I'm going to start by asking uh, Stefan um, to give us a sense, maybe first of all, um, I want to ask you, how do you feel about the realism or how realistic these targets are uh, that the Commission set itself uh, and set countries, including Germany, uh, back in March 2021? Stefan. Yeah, thank you very much, Lawrence. I think the targets are indeed very ambitious, but on the other hand, we need ambitious targets. Uh, we need tough aims, as you, as you said uh, before. Of course, uh, our common aim is uh, to make uh, Europe uh, to a very uh, important uh, player in the digital field. 
and therefore we need a digital single market not only the eu single market also a digital single market and therefore we need tough aims uh, so we all can work uh, to reach these aims in the in the next years and can you give me a bit of a sense of where germany stands and how germany wants to reach its own it's it's the the, the national uh, version of, of those of those targets and aims Yes, indeed. Uh, we are just working in my ministry at, uh, for, for uh, a so-called uh, federal government digital strategy. And we discuss here with all the other ministries in our government what are our aims for 2025. This is the end of the current uh, government. And therefore, we are defining the aims that we want to reach within the next five years, in the next four years. And we are waiting for the uh, contributions from the different ministries we want to address in this uh, German federal uh, government uh, digital strategy. All the issues uh, beginning from uh, e-government, beginning from economy, digital economy, uh, the health sector, the skills sector. So all the areas where we need a push in digitization in the next years. So I cannot answer you the concrete aims that we had at the end of this period of the government, but we are working on this. And uh, I can uh, give you a short example that indeed we want to have very ambitious uh, goals mm. also for Germany. One goal, for example, is that we want to have uh, fiber to the home for all citizens in the next years. This is also very ambitious and we are working on a gigabit strategy also in Germany. So ambitious aims are necessary, but at the end, we only can work uh, together within the European Union. Therefore, we need uh, this uh, single market and we need uh, the cooperation within the EU with all the member states. Great, thank you. Um, Josiane, if I can bring you in. Uh, so um, the, 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 the plan, the digital decade in its totality, goes into all different elements. Uh, there's num there's uh, issues on skills, there's targets on, on infrastructure, etc. Uh, we've heard um, Stefan mention uh, digital infrastructure and sort of, so parts of this is new, parts of this is going into 5G, parts of this is going into chips, etc. Uh, other parts are sort of longer standing uh, issues that Europe has, has grappled with in, in the past years. Uh, some of those include digital skills, which has been an issue for long. Uh, another includes uh, the target to turn more startups into unicorns, into large companies, uh, which is also something that Europe um, has, has struggled with uh, in the past. So how do you feel about the balance between the sort of the long standing issues that Europe is having um, on the digital uh, sector and in the digital economy versus sort of the, the ambitions on the new technology? I'd like to start from what you mentioned regarding skills and connectivity and make an important observation. I really believe that before the pandemic struck, we we're more focused on the skills, which believe me, I really believe in and are very much important. And there is a lot also on the digital ticket on skills and how we need to improve on that, both within the workplace, for our SMEs, for the employer, employees, but also for our citizens. But once the pandemic struck, we came to realize that we need also the connectivity. The connectivity, which is key, and which goes beyond streaming a normal movie, but the connectivity to be able to access certain essential services. So I really believe that the pandemic was a wake up call in the sense that whilst we know that digitalization was accelerated because of the pandemic, both when it comes to public services going online, but also when it comes to digitalization at the workplace, I really think that it, it showed us how important we need to look at the various components of, of digitalization. And here I wanted to bring in some statistics which I brought with me. The Digital Decade is putting forward a policy program where we'll be working with member states to ensure there is more convergence, but whilst at the same time giving them flexibility to achieve those targets. And in this regard, we need to make sure that we achieve certain percentages and targets. But there's still a gap. 
And it's important to start from this, that we know that we're facing this gap and that to achieve those targets, those ambitious targets, which yes, I really believe that we need to be ambitious, even though they might seem difficult, we need to work a lot together. And let me quote a bit of figures here. In 2019, only 56% of your citizens possessed at least basic digital skills. As for connectivity, according to the last DESI index, data only 59% of households can benefit from fixed very high capacity network with an important gap which we need to mention between urban and rural areas which we cannot ignore. The digitalization of businesses, which is also another key element of, of the digital decade. In 2020, only 60% of SMEs had basic level of digital intensity. And we, knew, we know how important it is to help our SMEs digitalize because it's one of the barriers for them to really be at the forefront. And as for your government, Yes, there's still a lot of work to do. In 2020, 64% of internet users interacted with public administration online compared to 58% in 2015. So between 2015 and 2020, there wasn't such a huge gap. And the online availability of public services then increased because of the, the COVID. I really believe that here we need to work together to achieve this digital transition effectively. We need the member states, and this is what we'll, we're doing in this policy program, which I'm negotiating with other colleagues, as shadow reporter for The Socialist, and our also reporter Martina Dablayova has presented her report in the European Parliament, which we're negotiating. But we also need the citizens and businesses on board, and that's very much essential. And that's why we need also to look at ways of how we can collaborate all together to make these targets really effective in reality. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Liz, if you don't mind, I want to bring you in on one specific um, uh, or one, one group of, um, of, of, of issues mentioned in, in the strategy, uh, which is uh, those on investment, uh, those on, on uh, boosting startups, uh, those on uh, making sure that Europe's SMEs uh, can grow and, and, and digitize. Um, and then the specific element of uh, doubling EU unicorns, which I think is, uh, is, is one specific target uh, included in there that, that sort of an eye catcher, but, but again, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, probably a difficult one to achieve. So uh, one of the discussions we're having in Europe often is that um, in the last um, digital transformation, or at least the last sort of big boom of the digital economy, uh, Europe fell behind uh, uh, versus countries like the US, for instance. And um, uh, saying something like doubling EU unicorns, um, uh, you know, sometimes get the criticism of uh, trying to copy uh, whatever is happening in other parts of the world like the United States. I'm wondering um, what your take is on uh, whether Europe is really finding its own strength here um, or whether it is sort of still t looking uh, towards other parts of the world that have success in the digital economy a little too much. Yeah, these are great questions, um, and and I bring my own comments um, from the vantage point of serving serving companies like that. We serve tech unicorns around the world. We serve um, we serve traditional companies that are creating new digital businesses that they and themselves would be ideally becoming their own tech unicorns. But um, you know, the ambitions are are aggressive, wonderfully so. Seventy five percent of of digital transformations across Europe. That's where the world is going. I, 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 I believe this is, this is in line with progress, with the post-COVID innovation sprints, with uh, just what co you know, consumer expectation is. Um, I think the real advantage that Europe has here, and it will, of course, extend to the, to the startups within Europe, is in the same way that my kids are digital natives, they were just born into it. You know, they're almost teenagers now, and that's all they know. I think the beauty of Europe, and we all benefit from this around the world, is um, it's the global regulatory standards. Like GDPR was sort of a masterpiece in this way, and I and I think that the the AI regulations and you know the Digital Services and Digital Markets Act, the legislation is is very um, sort of conscience based, and trust as a foundation is a given. And because I believe firmly, I, I co-lead a, a service line called Digital Trust. I believe firmly that trust is currency in this new data-driven world, in this AI-driven world. The advantage of it 
and then I'll get to, I think, sort of um, expectations around about statistics. The advantage is just being a regulatory native in Europe. You know that trust needs to be baked in. Um, this is the heart of sort of conscience-driven, um, you know, human-centered AI and data, um, you know, cross-border flows. So that said, there is a great there, there's a great increase in in you know the tech unicorns, which of course are you know post money valuation of one billion or more. This is we have um, I we, we've I, you know we've seen statistics that there's been a rapid increase. It is not caught up with the U.S. yet, but um, but what I think is the advantage, and and ironically, it's almost begging for reg tech startups within Europe, given that that that's sort of the the home of it. But um, where a company, and we are finding this across all jurisdictions, where a company has built trust in to its approach to uh, digitization, that is correlated, and we believe probably largely caused by, its approach to, to trust. And by that, I mean there is a coherent address of you know, responsible AI, human-centered AI, um, data privacy baked in, you know, privacy by design, and increasingly ethics by design. And lastly, I'll say that um, you know, as these as these companies sort of fight it out for market share and for money, um, we we see that there's the consumer um, increasing consumer value is same in the ESG space with sustainability, increasing consumer value on this this trust that will drive we believe consumer alignment with the companies that are doing this right. So I think that's a, a huge advantage for the tech unicorns in Europe. And I think also um, there's just, there is, there's a lot of money going to Europe and there's a lot of innovation coming out of it. So um, will they rival the U.S.? Remains to be seen, but there's a good running start. Funny, I want to bring you on on the issue of trust or the question of trust and, and, and whether it's a competitive advantage for, for Europe. Um, I think, you know, since we're at the AI and Tech Summit, um, I'll phrase the question around AI. But uh, the question here really seems to be what the European Union did with GDPR uh, in terms of imposing a global standard in terms of hard law and then um, uh, making that um, uh, sort of bring, bringing that to other parts of the world um, in various forms. Uh, do you think it can replicate that? Uh, do you consider that a success so far? And do you think it can replicate that in other areas like AI? Sure. Um, so, yes, I, I think the strength and the uniqueness of the EU and Europe more broadly is that we have more than just values, declarations, ethics principles, or or just trust as a generic term, but we have fundamental rights that are enshrined in, in law that are binding and enforceable. And we definitely need more than just trust and soft power and di diplomacy. And I think to have human rights in the digital age in law is of paramount importance based on the Charter of the Fundamental Rights. And I, yes, my answer is yes to the GDPR. It is a success, um, although we know that it, it requires some improvements in enforcement. And um, I have a small list of um, reforms that are more concrete than some of the very ambitious uh, targets in this discussion. And I think that's where the EU should start uh, to, to achieve those principles like people being at the center and having control or having trustworthy AI for that matter. First of all, we at Access now advocate for the EU to ensure the confidentiality of electronic communications, to ban practices that adversely impact people's rights to privacy and freedom of expression. And this should include behavioral targeted tracking as well. Um, in terms of interoperability, uh, it must be implemented in a way that it uh, maintains uh, the level of privacy and security via end-to-end -end encryption. And for AI, we want the uh, European Union to protect people's rights, both EU citizens and third country nationals, including banning the most harmful applications, such as biometric mass surveillance, emotion recognition, and predictive policing. Some of these were discussed more in more detail this morning. And uh, the EU's new content moderation rule book 
or the Digital Services Act, if we want to use the, the EU terminology, should tackle illegal online content, make, make uh, digital spaces safer. And we have seen how important it is that tech companies develop a transparent, but also equitable framework for emergency and crisis situations. And lastly, just to react to what uh, Commissioner Reinders also was, was speaking about, in terms of privacy shield, we know that a long-term framework for data flows is equally important for people's rights, but businesses as well. But so far, what we have seen about this um, agreement in principle, it more forecasts uh, a SHRAMS-3 decision uh, instead of ensuring rights and legal certainty. And finally, while I know we are discussing 2030, these reforms that I discussed are already on the negotiation table. Some of them are negotiated as we speak. So hopefully they will get adopted closer to 2022 than to 2030, but you never know with EU lawmaking process. <laughs> it's, uh, we'll we'll see where where we end up somewhere in that time frame. Um, uh, I'm sure. Um, I'm going to take a question from uh, from uh, the chat. Uh, we have a number of questions coming in, and uh, thank you to our audience for uh, for bringing those in. Um, so I will um, bring a question to you all, um, which is on the digital skills gap. Um, and we've got a question from Ray Wright, who's asking. Um, to what extent is the stated goal of achieving gender convergence overshadowed? Uh, this is uh, the goal of, of achieving gender convergence in the digital economy. Um, how 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 is Europe going to get there? And 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 is it um, is it getting enough attention uh, within the whole uh, of of the uh, of digital uh, compass? Uh, would be the question. Um, who would be who would be interested to um, um, to talk about uh, gender convergence? Yes, please, Rosian. So first of all, thanks for uh, for the person. What the, the name? Uh, Ray Wright, yes. Thank you, Thank Ray, you, Ray, for bringing in this very important question. Indeed, it's in important that we have gender mainstreaming and gender convergence within the digital transition and within all the policies that we do at the European institutions. And it's indeed a very important point. We know that there's the gender gap which exists, even when it comes to digitalization. And that's why I also link on the importance that colleagues on the panel have highlighted the importance that we look at the wider societal goals of digitalization. It's important to have targets like the 2030 targets in the digital decade, but let's not forget that digitalization and technology is there to serve the people and we should really adopt a human-centric approach and inclusive approach. And inclusiveness also refers to addressing gender biases, addressing gender gaps in this regard. And it's a very important aspect and it's a point I also emphasize as a member of the digital transformation working group at the conference of the future of Europe as we're going through the citizens uh, recommendations where we also emphasize the importance of eliminating gender biases and al al algorithmic biases and this is very much important so yes it's a key it's key to to keep gender convergence at the center also of, of, our, uh, of our work on digitalization and the digital transformation. And it's something we're looking into also in the digital decade. Thank you. And maybe funny uh, if I can ask you, uh, so uh, the aspect of, of uh, gender bias, for instance, in, in uh, a piece of legislation like the AI Act, um, how, you how do you feel um, this, this piece of legislation managed to really tackle that or, or get to the, the heart of the issue? One important element when we throw the word bias into these conversations uh, around any sensitive characteristics and data and not just gender, but, but other, there is, um, there is a argument uh, that um, in order to tackle that bias and, and discrimination, we need to provide these systems with more data to make them more accurate. And I just really want to caution against this uh, narrative. If there's an AI system that is discriminatory, then it should not exist. And it's not our job 
to provide even more sensitive data, so to say, let, uh, as opposed to those data being protected just to correct the, the mistakes and legal consequences and uh, um, negative, negative impact on human rights of those systems. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um I want to turn to another um, sort of part of um, what, um, you know, the, the, another part that's defining uh, some of the targets uh, more geared towards uh, Europe's role in uh, the cloud sector, for instance, Europe's role in the semiconductor sector um, and uh, infrastructure issues. Um, and um, I, I'd like to turn my question to Stefan. So um, within the whole uh, compass, uh, there seems to be a pivot towards more of an industrial policy uh, perspective uh, than there was before uh, in previous administrations in the, in the commission, uh, in previous uh, mandates in the commission. Uh, obviously, the, this, is, this has the full support of, uh, of Berlin, um, um, uh, the past and, and the present government. And I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, um, the European uh, examples of industrial policy at the at the EU level um, haven't always been as successful um, as uh, they would have hoped to be. Uh, so my question is, is, what is different this time uh, when Europe is proposing a number of industrial policies in, on batteries, on cloud, on on um, on semiconductors, and and more? Uh, what is different this time uh, that will ensure that they actually work? Yes, I think uh, we need we need these actions that you mentioned before. This is also a question of uh, the digital sovereignty, and we need in Europe this uh, digital sovereignty. At the end, I think our aim must be uh, to strengthen our own competences uh, in uh, Germany, in Europe, to ensure innovative strengths and uh, future security. On the one hand, regulation, you mentioned the GDPR, the AI Act and so on. These regulation can uh, intensify these uh, innovation. It also can uh, be uh, uh, hindering, it also can hinder innovation. So we need also the right balance uh, in this field. But at the end, uh, the task of um, uh, digital sovereignty is uh, from for, uh, of uh, strategic importance uh, from my point of view uh, for um, a political and we need a political and industrial commitment on national and European level. And I think that all the big companies, but also the SMEs know that we have to strengthen these activities in the next years. Therefore, I think uh, that it is an, indeed an other situation since uh, some years ago. We have another geopolitical situation at moment, so we need this um, uh, engagement. And I think that the digital compass strategy, including the political program, uh, are important contributions to this uh, to accelerate the EU's uh, digital transformation and to strengthen digital sovereignty. At the end, we need the infrastructure. We need infrastructure on cloud, because data is uh, the future of our economy. Therefore, we need uh, secure cloud infrastructures uh, and we need um, the skills that we have mentioned. We need all these areas and we have to bring uh, um, 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 uh, yeah, uh, progress in all these areas in the future to strengthen Europe's uh, digital sector. We've we've heard that that message from from uh, Germany for a couple of years now. I think cloud is is a sector in particular that's been that's been identified as 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 a problem uh, early on, um, earlier than uh, the semiconductor uh, sector and 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 others. Uh, but but still, it's hard to see uh, the market changing. Um, so how do you feel how do you feel about the progress so far in a sector like cloud? Yeah, I think I think we have we have made progress in the past, uh, but it's a long process. We cannot uh, uh, build up our own infrastructure, our own sovereign Europe uh, infrastructure within one year. Uh, the infrastructures that we have from the big companies are the result of a work of uh, uh, ten years, and so we need a little bit time. But the progress that, for example, Gaia X made in the in the past. I think this is a very good progress and they worked on standards, uh, they worked on uh, cooperation between different countries and I hope and I'm sure that we will be successful within this year that we have first services and first offers by Gaia-X uh, in, in this year. One example from my ministry is uh, the so-called uh, mobility data space. This is also based on the Gaia-X infrastructure 
This is very important in the uh, mobility sector for the future that we can um, uh, um, uh, work here with the data from the mobility sector in a secure and in a reliable way. This is one good example based on uh, the Gaia X infrastructure. And at the end, the same is uh, true, for example, in the semiconductor area. We are building the first manufacturing, uh, the man f first uh, factories here in Europe uh, to build our own chips in Europe. And this is important to reduce the dependencies that we had in the, in the past, because we need uh, semiconductor, we need chips for all of our products in the future, because all products are connected to the internet and therefore we need it. The same is true for battery technology, for electromobility. We need uh, battery technology also in Europe and not only uh, from, uh, from other parts of the world. Therefore, I think uh, the uh, pressure to do more is uh, more intensive like in the past and the current situation with the terrible war in uh, Ukraine uh, shows that we need more uh, sovereignty, not autarky, this is uh, definitive, uh, definitely not uh, the case, but we need more sovereignty in this geopolitical situation. Liz, if I can bring you in um, uh, maybe for a reality check or just your thoughts, uh, to what extent is um, is this necessary from from one uh, perspective, but also but also feasible uh, to 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 really sort of uh, turn away from uh, foreign technology, quote unquote, uh, in some of these uh, in the, of these markets. I mean, I think I, I won't say what is advisable, but I would say um, this protecting industrial bases and, and everyone's worried about, you know, um, obviously supply chain and capabilities and, um, and you know, just uh, crisis planning. And I, and I, and so I think it's, it's wise to, to get creative with, um, I think thinking back from uh, a range of really tricky scenarios is, is useful. So I think, um, what I see the successful companies doing is having a very comprehensive plan for resilience across all of the issues, um, and I, and and having um, independence and you know a, an industrial base across all the different components is part of that resilience, as is a good solid network of partners, um, which we see companies doing. So I would say um, there's. There's a there's a lot of new solutions coming with um, with partnering with um, resilience um, and I I think these are these are targets for every um, you know future proofed company um, so I um, change is coming and I think there's a great deal of um, you know a requirement to to be agile in a way that like North Star strategic planning is no longer sufficient. There's a, there's just this new agile across every component of, of running an organization that's necessary, kind of taking into account regulatory interpretations, uh, you know, geopolitical conflicts. Um, so I think it's what, what is the most compelling for organizations that we serve is when they when they go into it, I don't want to call it war room status, but but really just sort of resilience status where sort of anything could happen. So what, how would you cover the bases and what would your crisis response be from, from materials to people to, um, you know, cross-border data flows um, and just being ready to pivot quickly uh, as, as new information comes in. Great, thank you. Um, I want to stick with uh, the the question on 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 the international aspect here. Um, maybe Josiane, if I can if I can bring you on on this. Uh, so um, a, a part of the strategy obviously is reliant on work with uh, with partners uh, like U.S. like other countries. Uh, the international partnerships are meant to are meant to help uh, Europe sort of you know reach reach those targets. Um, there's a lot of work being done right now between the EU and the U.S. within the Trade and Technology Council, uh, which is a platform the European uh, Union has selected to sort of work on things like AI standards and on uh, all, all ranges of technology uh, and, and trade in, in technology. Um, so uh, to what extent, like how critical is this sort of success of, of the Trade and Technology Council uh, work right now to achieving those 2030 targets, you think? Uh, 
all sorts of collaboration that could help us achieve the targets, but also help us as the European Union lead the way in digitalization, I believe are much important. And I really would like the European Union not to stop at the china us dichotomy, but for us to have our own way. Earlier on, colleagues on the panel also mentioned the important aspect that as the European Union, we can have an edge when it comes to legislation, when it comes to regulation. And yes, we could lead the way and cooperate with other, other continents like the US when it comes to regulations and setting the standards. So it's really very important that we look at our own way of leading the way in digitalization. And I really believe that with smart regulation, we already had the success of the GDPR, but now we're working on several digital files, including the AI Act, which, which was mentioned, where I'm also working from the Tron perspective, where we're looking at how to introduce um, obligations and rules which do not impose double standards, but which at the same time make sure that the European Union's values are protected, that human rights are protected, but also that we achieve the full extent of the benefits of these new technologies. And I believe that as the European Union, it's good to discuss unicorns and how we can scale up. But let's not forget that we have a lot of SMEs, which are the backbone, as we always say, of our economy. But it's essential that we also utilize these SMEs. The, the SMEs, if we help them, could really be also at the forefront of this digital leap that we need to make. And let's look also at the importance of quality. So I look also at the importance of having quality when it comes to companies and businesses who deliver, to deliver services in the tech world and are related to digitalization. And that's a, a, it's a key point, I believe. Okay, great. Thank you. I'm going to ask an open question, but I'm going to... Um, re ah, sorry, Fanny, uh, Fanny, jump in. Can I, can I just pick up uh, on a point about the international data flows and the transatlantic Atlantic relationships? Uh, because I think um, it's, it captures uh, this interesting dynamic of, of laws and diplomacy, and now we are somewhere in the middle with all the announcement. And to offer some background for those who don't follow that debate that closely, there is a decision by the European Commission that deems uh, other systems adequate or essentially equivalent to the protections of the European Union, which allows data transfers between the countries. And there was such a thing, uh, privacy shield and before the safe harbor, and both were struck down by the EU court because the rights of Europeans were not respected in the US system. And there is a progress from Privacy Shield as we are now in the sense that at least we are moving beyond just some kind of informal commitment letters as, as they used to be. And now there's a discussion about a US executive order. But based on the information that we have at the moment, that executive order will be very likely insufficient as well, because in some areas such as um, redress in particular, new legislation in the US is necessary to meet the criteria set by the court. And while it's great that there is an administration in the United States that is, let's say, willing and different in terms of uh, approaches and negotiation and, and, and values as well, we should not give up on those uh, requirements by the court, because as I said in my uh, opening uh, short uh, list of, of reforms, if um, the executive order under delivers, we will be in the same position that the court will struck down the new agreement again. Stefan, you, you wanted to jump in as well. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, please uh, let me underline that also from my point of view, uh, the international cooperation is extremely important also for European Union. We need uh, this cooperation uh, with partners who share the same values like we. And I think that Europe and the US, for example, the same is true for Japan, uh, share the same values and therefore we have to work together. You mentioned the unicorns at the beginning of our discussion and we also want to build unicorns in Europe. But 
then they also need a worldwide market uh, for their business. And therefore, it is important that we have similar rules in Europe, in the United States uh, for the companies so that they can grow up and that they can use the different markets. And the free flow of data is one absolutely precondition at moment in this field. So I am I'm very happy that we have a, a new regulation for the EU Privacy Shield. We address uh, the uh, free flow of data with trust also within the G7 uh, presidency in uh, German presidency this year in the Digital Ministerial Conference in May. Uh, we also want to get progress in the free flow of data within the G7 countries, the world uh, leading countries, economy leading countries worldwide. And therefore, I think the cooperation, the international cooperation between these countries is extremely important for all of us, for the citizens, for the economy, uh, especially in the current situation of the geopolitical situation. Okay. I'm going to ask one question following up on the international partners, uh, a question to all, uh, and then I'm going to turn to a question from the audience and um, remind the audience that they can ask questions using the Swap Card, card uh, app uh, that this e event is being held on. Uh, but my question on international partners is, uh, um, and uh, I'd like to request a one, a one answer, a, w a short answer, as in a, a one word uh, answer uh, but we talk a lot about the US we've just spent five minutes talking about the US or a little a little more uh, if there was one other partner country or region that you want to highlight that Europe should be engaging with uh, to achieve these goals which one is it um, and um, I might just whoever wants to go first can go first in this case I'd say Brazil I would say um, you know, I, what I see in, in the Brazil's sort of data legislation is very similar to Europe's. I think it's remarkable untapped markets. Um, I think the values are similar. The legislation looks similar. There's there's a ripple effect from GDPR over to Brazil. And that um, that to me is a very exciting um, area for cooperation and um, and also just also just materials and, you know, opportunity. So, um, there's, of course, all of Asia, and I'm sure someone will answer this, but I, I think Brazil is very exciting. Okay, thank you, Liz. It's very kind. Funny, you, you want to go next? I'll take another spin, and um, my response is Hungary, but in a different way. <laughs> I, th I think when, when we look at these questions, we, the European Union institutions must be much stronger in enforcing the rights and values and, and, and all these uh, the issues under these targets internally as well. And as we discussed the Pegasus uh, scandal, but rule of law more broadly, I think it's unacceptable how, how well, I don't want to say impotent, but it, it, it has been really, really weak what the commission has done to enforce uh, human rights in, in Hungary. And I was really disappointed this morning to hear and Commissioner Reinders' comments about lack of competence in enforcing those rights in the context of surveillance. And Pegasus, yeah, thank you. Shosian, if you want to go. Okay, let me declare my bias, first of all. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm a member of the Australian-New Zealand delegation at the European Parliament, and we had several exchanges on legislation which is being introduced to when it comes to regulating big platforms and it, when it comes to digital, digital rights and obligations. And I really believe that the Australia-New Zealand, we have quite some also similar values which we could explore more when it comes to collaboration with them even when it comes to digitalization okay great and uh, stefan i heard you mention japan uh, a little yes. while back um so i'll accept it as an answer but if you want to take another spin don't don't hesitate no i i think indeed uh, japan is a very important partner also for us uh, they also share the same values uh, like we and we have an agreement, for example, between the European Union and Japan about the free flow of data. This is a best practice from my point of view. And we also have to look to the Asian area. And Japan is one, I think, good example. Um, and uh, US, Canada, no problem. Uh, these are also areas where we have to work closely together with. 
Great, thank you. I'm going to take one more question from the audience uh, from the app, and then I'm afraid we're going to have to um, end uh, our session. Uh, but uh, the audience comes from Thomas Jorgensen, uh, who's asking, what about Europe's role as a research leader? How can we keep up R&D investment with more money being spent? Well, so how can we keep up R&D investment with more money being spent on defense, health, energy, and other areas? Um, Josiane, if you want to... Yes, research is very much indeed important, and thanks also for picking up on this very important point. And we have a lot of funds dedicated to research, which we need to utilize. And when we speak of research, it's essential that we see to it that we look at the various kinds of collaboration between the public sector and the private sector with third countries, where also that is fruitful. And even through Horizon Europe funds and other important funds, it's essential that Yes, when it comes to research and investment, we focus on it and realize that it's the way forward too. If we need to lead the way, we need to invest in uh, the important area of research. Great, fantastic. Thank you very much for that discussion. Uh, it was fun. Um, I'm uh, taking with me that Japan, Brazil, Australia and maybe unfortunately Hungary are the countries that um, uh, might need most work uh, for the European Union and its in international trans uh, uh, partnerships. Um, it's, been, uh, it's been a fun discussion. Thank you for joining us here in the room and thank you for joining us online. And uh, the next session I will tell you immediately um, is a spotlight discussion on tech and climate, uh, the state of play in the twin transitions. And that one is moderated by Leonie Cater, our sustainability reporter at Politico Europe. Thank you very much. <laughs>